Um, Dr. Hannah Vlivewerner is the leader of the Old Myths New Facts project. Within the project, she researches the Latin liturgical repertory tradition in the broader Central European region in the 15th century, including rhythmicized chant, Cantus Fractus, and its relation to or differences from other European traditions. She also studies Czech liturgical repertory as recorded in the Jistovnice Cancional and other contemporary sources. And the title of her paper today is Ministry Speciales Beati Virginis at St. Vitus's Cathedral in Prague, Liturgy, Repertory and Sources. And just before I hand over to Hannah, we will be taking the questions at the end of all three papers, uh, but feel free to put any questions in the chat as you come across them um, or note them down and we'll do all the questions together. So on that, I hand over to Dr. Hannah Vlevenbrunna. Thank you. Thank you, Rianit, for, for this kind introduction, and uh, thank you all of you joining us for uh, the workshop today. Uh, what I will present here today is a very abbreviated uh, version of a book chapter uh, that for a book on San Vitus Cathedral and its music, which is long overdue. Uh, but if you have any questions, please uh, that rise after this paper, please don't have, hesitate to to, uh, to send, uh, send me an email. It will be a very very small um, uh, selection of rich material that we have um, uh, relating to this. Topic. I will now share my screen and start the PowerPoint. And here we go. During our two day workshop, we present texts, music, and visual arts dedicated to Marian devotion in the late Middle Ages. In my contribution, I will briefly present an exclusive institution of servants of St. Vitus Cathedral that greatly contributed to the practice of Marian devotion in late medieval Bohemia, and very probably also to the distribution of new music repertory for Marian votive services in Central Europe. I will talk about the Collegium of the so-called Mansionari or Ministri Speciales Beate Virginis at St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague that was established by Emperor Charles IV of Luxembourg in collaboration with the Prague Archbishop, uh, in, uh, Archbishop and in uh, connection with the institution of Prague Archbishop Press in 1344, shortly before the foundation of the new Gothic Cathedral in 1748. And here we have the cathedral. All these foundations supported the political plans of the emperor who aimed to promote Prague, the capital of the Bohemian kingdom, to a new European metropolis. The elevated position of the main church of the Prague arch archdiocese should be manifested in the lavishly presented daily liturgical performance. Until then, several groups of singers were responsible for the liturgical singing in the cathedral. 32 canons and the same number of the deputies, vicars, 30 choristers and two boy singers, so-called Bonifantes, who were joined by a presumably small group of children from the cathedral school. The foundation of Mansionari was shortly followed by the establishment of the last singing body, the so-called Psalteristi in 1360, who had to sing the Psalter continuously and aloud, alta voce, through the day and night. As with many other medieval religious foundations, at the very beginning of the project was a dream, which Charles later described extremely vividly in his biography, the Vita Caroli. During his Italian journey in 1333, so he says, in the night after the feast of the ascension of the Virgin Mary, when he stayed in Terenzo in Northern Italy, he dreamed about a terrible suffering and the death of his distant cousin, the Dauphin Quido of Vienne. The actual plan to establish a Marian Collegium in Prague came as a sudden flash of inspiration several years later, in 1341, when he tra traveled again through North Italy and re remembered his traumatic, or in the words of his contemporaries, miraculous experience. The canons pensionari were extremely generously financed and gained additional exclusive privileges. The collegium consisted of 24 members led by a presenter who was primarily responsible for organizational and economical matters. 
12 senior members, the so-called Mansionari Maiores, were ordained priests, appointed by the Emperor Charles himself. And after his death, this right came to uh, the Benz his son, um, the Emperor's, Emperor Wenceslas IV. 12 junior members, Mansionari Minores, were of a lower church rank, six deacons and six subdeacons, and their selection was reserved for senior members. The line between both groups was set firm, and the strict hierarchy later became a co cause of growing tensions, generally over financial matters, which eventually led to open conflict that had to be resolved by the emperor himself. Formerly, minor mansionari always remained in the position of assistance to major mansionari during and partly also outside the liturgy, taking care of liturgical vestments, among other duties. The original position of Mancionari as an exclusive Marian collegium was extended at the beginning of the second half of the 14th century when they were entrusted with the anniversaries for the deceased members of the Luxembourg dynasty and the care of their sepulchres. A commemoration for the Emperor Charles, the founder of the collegium, became part of the regular compliant prayer after his death. The mission of the newly established chapter was to perform the daily office of the Holy Virgin exclusively and to celebrate a Marian Mass in the second Marian choir of the St. Peter's Church. And here we have the, uh, back, uh, the ground floor of the church where all places, important places are um, shown here. The, what I um, call with the letter A is the main uh, altar B is the, here is the, was the Marian altar and here C it was the place of Charles the fourth tomb. The celebration of the daily morning Marian mass had been instituted at San Vito several decades earlier in 1328 on the initiative of the Prague sacristan Lupulus Vuk Duhoni and with the support of the canon Oldrich of Fabienice, one of Prague's administrators and during this time already the abbot of the influential Cistercian monastery in Sedlats. The link has some significance as the daily Marian morning mass was celebrated in the Cistercian order from the early 14th century. The commitment to the daily Marian office is strikingly similar to the religious program of the San Vitus Bonifantes. The introduction of a parallel liturgical program into the already busy regular cathedral schedule caused inevitable clashes between individual groups performing literally simultaneously different liturgical offices. Already in the 1350s, shortly after the institution of the Mansionari, the Prague Archbishop Ernestus issued a new regulation in which he required the Mansionari and the presentor to start with their regular office hours at the mass earlier due to the time pressure. The discussions also concerned the organization of processions. Mansionari were obliged to take part in processions at Vespers on Sundays and were requested to omit the Marian office on major feasts, such as Christmas or Easter, and to join the San Vitus chapter in the main choir, as the regular office occupied too much time. In Czech historical books, the Collegium of Mansionari has been described as an exclusive music institution epitomizing the late medieval exalted Marian devotion on one hand and the decline of the church moral on the other. The attempt to present them as clergymen of low standards interested more in financial matters than in music performance, a portrayal nourished for decades by Marxist historians, is certainly incorrect, just as any expectations of the above average musical abilities are overstated. Illuminating in this context is the detailed protocol from the installation of Matthias of Prague, Matthias Clericus de Praga, into the office of a minor mansionarius in 1398. After being examined in reading, singing, and knowledge of the Collegium statutes and customs, Matthias was accepted, but at the same time, he was requested to improve his singing abilities during the following 12 months. Strictly speaking, the repertory of Mansionari, limited already by definition, Ministry Beate Maria, was rather narrow, based on the performance of the votive office for the Virgin Mary. This is reflected in the scope and character of the book collection, which was 
given their high income and exclusive position within the cathedral clergy, surprisingly small. The inventory of their belongings from the 1410s includes a respectful number of vestments made from expensive materials, some even decorated with precious furs, but only a handful of books, among them one gradual, one antiphonal, and four missiles. Only one liturgical book that has an unmistakable attribution to the Mansionari can be identified today. The breviary, the so-called uh, Cursus Mansionariorum, included in one book together with the statutes and the calendar with anniversaries. There is nothing out of the ordinary in the execution or decoration of the manuscript that would correspond to the lavish appearance of the Collegium in the church. Average in formate, it's 21.5 to 15 centimeter. It's just normal manuscript. It remains today, however, the only reliable source with a detailed description of the liturgy of the Mansionari and its specific differences from the Prague Cathedral use. The twofold collegium's position within the liturgical program in San Vitus and their partial participation in the ceremonies in the main choir and chapter's processions is manifested in the unusual arrangement of the breviary, which includes two different series of chants and prayers. According to the use of the Mansionari, it starts with Incipit Cursus Sancte Maria Secundum Mansionario Rum Consvetludinem per Circulum Ani, and following, uh, according to the use of the Prague Church, Incipit Odo Antifonariorum Responsoriorum Capitulorum and Collectarum Similiter Cum Rubrica Pragensis. Four Marian festivities that were declared, declared obligatory for the Prague Church already from 1336, namely the Purification, Annunciation, Assumption, and Nativity, constitute the core of the repertory. Additionally, the Cursus Mansionariorum, but not the Odo of the San Vitus Quai, includes the Feast of the Conception, which is already mentioned as the fifth major Marian feast that should be respected by Mansionari in the Papal Confirmation Chart. Generally, there are no substantial differences in the selection of the liturgical chants written in both series. On the contrary, it all indicate that the daily prayer of the Collegium was created by a simple derivation of the established cathedral repertory. The selection of the liturgical texts displays only occasional dissimilarities to the Prague use, such as the arrangement of first Vespers for the Purification that contains five antiphons instead of antiphona sola prescribed in the manuscripts for the San Vitus chapter. The closing section the, in the Cursus Mansionari contains texts of chants and prayers for the Marian Mass. Similarly to the selection of the texts for the office, the Mass chants can be widely identified in the cathedral use. All chants of the Mass proper, the enjoyed Salve Sancta Parents, Graduale Benedicta et Venerabilis, Alleluia Prophete Sancti, I will switch to the next slide where we have the overview. Uh, Offertory Recordare Virgo Mater, and Communio Averegina Celorum uh, belong to the mid 14th century uh, to the cathedral's established repertory, which was, as it seems, already in the first half of the 14th century, rich with genuine late medieval editions represented in the selection above by the uh, Offertory Recordare Virgo Mater and the Communio Averegina Celorum. The only somewhat enigmatic element is the prescription of the sequence or prosa audinos that could not be identified in the Prague liturgical books. The rubric Kyrie eleison de Virgine stands without any doubt for the Kyrie o Paraclite, which is the abbreviated version of the prominent Marian trope Kyrie Rex Virginum Amator Deus, which is prescribed together with the trope Gloria Spiritus et Alme in numerous San Vitus liturgical manuscripts. On the other hand, it is difficult to decide which Sanctus, labelled in the selection briefly as De Domina, uh, the scribe had in mind. Uh, as the Prague Ordinary Chant collections include a vast number of Sanctus with and without robes that could be performed during Marian feasts and commemorations. 
Finally, the selection of readings and texts of prayers are identical with the compilation of Marian votive mass prescribed for the Tempus per Annum in San Vitus manuscripts. Given the scope of the Marian repertory preserved in other Prague manuscripts, the selection of Marian chants in the Cursus Mansionariorum is surprisingly small. This concerns particularly selections of the Alleluia chant for Spartum and the sequence Audinos, where the rubric Ver Aliot quod placet, Ver Alia quod placet, replaces what is in other mass books a long and during the 14th century considerably growing list of Marian Alleluias mostly representing the recent additions to the established repertory. Uh, there seemed to be a contradiction to the appraised daily glorious celebration at St. Vitus, in which up to 24 members of the Collegium participated. More probably, the breviary truthfully reflects the original arrangement of the morning matura, compiled by the sacristan lupus Duhoni, as it was adapted by the Collegium with a foundation in 1344. It is hard to imagine that the Collegium would, during the following decades, remain immune against any novelties in the repertory reflected in other St. Vitus liturgical books. We can rather assume that the basic repertory was later revised and enlarged. A monumental and lavishly decorated gradual has been preserved in the library of the National Museum, which is assigned to the uh, Collegium of Pragmans, which I assigned to the Collegium of Pragmansionari for several reasons uh, several years ago. In earlier literature, this manuscript was situated in the monastery of the Carmelites at the Church of Our Lady of Snow in the old city of Prague, founded in 1347 again by the Emperor Charles IV. However, as I have ex recently explained elsewhere, the specific repertory and rubrics clearly indicate that the manuscript must have been associated with Prague Cathedral and specifically the Collegium of Mansionari. Two mass proper cycles at the beginning, beginning of the Marian repertory indicate the general liturgical frame with two large sets of additional Alleluia chants and sequences. What I am showing here is the uh, description, more detailed description of the content of the gradual as it is published on uh, the database Hypnologica CZ, and I'm switching to the next uh, section. Uh, two mass proper cycles at the beginning of the Marian repertory indicate the general liturgical frame with two large sets of additional Alleluia chants and sequences. The second mass recorded here is Salve Sancta Parents, which had been performed in the cathedral during the Saturday votive messes from at least the beginning of the 14th century, and which was according to the Scursus Mansionarium, as we could see, also adapted for the daily Marian mass. The use of the other mass proper with the Untold Rorate Seri, written as the first series, was as known from the rubrics included in Prague Missals, reserved exclusively for the Advent period, thus marking a beginning of the long-term tradition which continued in Prague well into the modern period, the so-called Rorate Messes. More interesting, in view of the character and scope of the repertory performed by Mansionari, are 16 additional Alleluia chants and 17 sequences, all dedicated to Virgin Mary. Both series consist of repertory documented in St. Vitus manuscripts, partly exclusively, and repertory uh, that was, is known uh, exclusively from, the, from this so-called Marian gradual. As for sequences, the first 10 pieces constituted a stable part of the St. Vitus repertory. Five of them included in the official books, starting with the sequence Ave Virgo Gloriosa, it's on Folio 30, 63 verso. The chants which follow are only sporadically documented in Bohemia, and a few of them are known so far only from the gradual, from this gradual. This is Alma Redemptoris Mater or Augusta Generosa Ave Virginalis Forma. A similar order that is established repertory first and new editions later can also be observed in the series of the Alleluia chants. The overall number of Alleluia chants for the Virgin Mary included in the collection is particularly high compared to the other liturgical books. Uh, 
Many of them are unknown outside Bohemia, which strongly suggests that the authors were domestic composers and even came from the cathedral milieu and were perhaps composed for the use of mansionari or bonifantes. Several chants in this group definitely display signs of experienced composing. The author's creative skills are striking, using largely standardized melodic elements, but putting them into a new context and giving them, despite their familiar appearance, an individual expression. The texts are influenced by private devotional culture, which can be observed in the text beginnings. All verses to the Alleluia starts with the invocation Ave, Salve, or simply O which put them alongside the greeting hymns and rhyme prayers that constitute the cortex of private devotional culture in the late Middle Ages. The melodies are without exception characterized by specific late medieval gesture, and I'm showing just because I'm coming, coming to the end, I'm showing just one example of late medieval composition, uh, which is Alleluia, Salve, Virgo, Flos. I'm coming to the uh, end. The Collegium of Mansionari became the first and only Prague religious institution that gained supranational character in the following decades. After the Prague model, Charles established two more Marian corporations in 1355, in Nuremberg and in the North Italian Terenzo, and another after 1365 in Magdeburg, all of them subordinate to the Prague Precentor. Additional corporations were established by the Bishop Przeclaw in Wroclaw in 1355 and later in the 1370s by Charles' brother Johannes in the Augustinian Monastery in the Moravian Metropolis Brno. None reached the size and importance of the Prague Collegium. Their direct connection to the prime Bohemian church very possibly served as an efficient channel for the distribution of the new Prague chant repertory to its surrounding regions. Thank you. Final, so the final paper is from D Dr. Lenka Halavkova. Lenka is an assistant professor at the Institute of Musicology at Charles University, Prague, as well as a team member of the Old Myths New Facts project. Her research interests include the relationship between monophony and monophony and polyphony in the song tradition of the late Middle Ages, codicological issues of musical sources, and the repertoire in the style of Cantus Fractus, and polyphonic music of domestic and foreign origin in Czech sources of the 15th and early 16th century. And the title of her paper today is Imperatrix Virgo Gloriosa from Codex Specialnik, circa 1480 to 1500, a revival of a forgotten Marian cancio. So thank you very much, Lenka, take it away. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction, Rianit, and I try to share my screen now. Sorry, I have to check. I have some, mu yeah, music examples, so sound is there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, late medieval devotional culture in Bohemia contributed significantly to European music history through the creation of sacred songs called canciones. Of course, not all songs preserved in Bohemian sources are of Bohemian origin, but the tradition established in the 14th century and documented in notated sources as well as in purely textual collections, considerably shaped the cultural life of the country in the following centuries and found its way abroad as well. If we look at the repertory of Marian canciones, there is a striking group of compositions with the text on Imperatrix addressing the Virgin Mary as the Empress of Heaven. Oh. Textual sources of their inspiration may be found within liturgical items, such as the sequences Imperatrix Angelorum Consolatrix Orphanorum 
and Imperatrix Gloriosa Potens et Imperiosa, or an Alleluia with the verse Imperatrix Egregia Jesu Mater et Filia, which interpolated with the trope Regina Celi Inclita in Bohemia. Within collections of canciones, we can identify the pieces Vale Imperatrix Celica and the Czech, Czech version Zdravas Cisarovna, two versions of Imperatrix Gloriosa, two versions of Imperatrix Egregia, and a rare Imperatrix Virgo Gloriosa. In my short paper, I will focus on polyphonic settings of Marian canciones on Imperatrix from the Codex Specialni. Their monophonic models represent two different traditions of canciones, which meet, somewhat surprisingly, in one source at the end of the 15th century. This small case study can then arouse discussion about the redefinition of genres of 15th century polyphony, the borders between sacred songs and motets, and the function of individual genres within late medieval devotional culture. The appearance of canciones on imperatrix is, in my opinion, a phenomenon analogous to the production of visual objects depicting the Virgin Mary with a crown as queen or empress of heaven. The relatively simple monophonic songs had the power to imprint the story, theological problem or moral into the minds of believers in a way that was easy to remember. An elaborated polyphonic texture performed by trained singers gives the original song an artistic shape of a sounding sculpture. If the model song can be still recognized by the listeners, the composition creates space for silent prayer and, at the same time, it allows the believers to participate mentally in the performance of the polyphony. The Cancio, Imperatrix Gloriosa for four voices, corresponds very well with these characteristics. The familiar tune is sung by the top voice in longer rhythmic volumes and prepared by the entrances of the bass and tenor. The three lower voices accompany the song in a contrapuntal network of individual melodic lines. Let us listen to the first stanza performed by members of the ensemble Schola Gregoriana Pragensis. The texture of the composition Imperatrix Virgo Gloriosa for three voices doesn't reveal at first sight any recognizable song model. The voices are composed as free counterpoint and they are rhythmically coherent. An enigmatic inscription for perverse na quinternu. At the beginning of contratenor, which means for perverse on quinter, so play for perverse on this medieval string instrument. 
points to the title of Missa for Perverse by Franco-Flemish composer Jacobus Barbero, based on an unknown chanson. Within the Central European sources, we find numerous Latin contrafacts of French chansons, and we might ask whether Imperatrix Virgo Gloriosa could be a sacred transformation of an originally secular song. But any connection with four perverse can be excluded for a very simple reason. Missa for perverse is composed in D mode, while Imperatrix is in E mode. Browsing the database Limup, I have recently noticed that there is one more Imperatrix Gloriosa copied uh, into the gradual 13C5A from the National Library in Prague. What a surprise when I found a monophonic tune in E mode composed in the style of 14th century canciones, very familiar to my colleague Jan Ziegelbauer. Let us listen to an example performed by Barbara Kabatkova, who kindly recorded the verses relevant for the polyphonic setting. Imperatrix Virgo Gloriosa, Pia Mater Dulcis O Maria, Advocata Nostra Pretibua, Defende Nos Amor Tepessima, Luxere No semper emite sed humiles, et in fide forte sed stabiles. Um, uh, this type of canciones was cultivated in intellectual circles in 14th and early 15th century Bohemia. When members of the German nations protested against the dominance of Czech-speaking academics at the Prague University and left the country after 1409, they contributed to the dissemination of canciones in Central Europe, the Netherlands and Scandinavia. The wave of Catholic immigration caused by the Hussite Wars in the 1420s and early 1430s also transmitted repertory from the pre hussite era. But the tradition of canciones written in chant notation seemed as if it would disappear from the cultural memory of 15th century Bohemia, because mensural canciones dominate in sources of local origin after that time. All the more surprising is the fact that the old forgotten cancio appears at the end of the 15th century, elaborated into three verse polyphony, and that someone felt the need to write down the monophonic version in the space left in the gradual 13a 5c around the same time. Where did they come from and how did they get to Prague? A little help. Uh, for further investigation may suggest another polyphonic Imperatrix Virgo Gloriosa, transmitted in the Codex Strahov, a collection of polyphony probably written for the use in the school at the Prague Cathedral by someone with close ties to the court of Emperor Frederick III. The setting of Imperatrix Virgo Gloriosa is written for two discount voices, so probably boys, uh, and a contratenor, we can imagine uh, an adult singing or an instrument. Uh, and it belongs to the group of little polyphonic compositions written in Codex Strahov with devotional texts, but similar to chansons in the form and treatment of voices. In this case, the text is set in D mode and music is written in relatively simple free counterpoint counterpoint 
with the little imitative entrances by the upper voices. Uh, but the appearance of the text testifies that the old Cancio was known in the 1460s at the imperial court, at least as a prayer. From the point of view of music historiography, the polyphonic compositions Imperatrix Gloriosa and Imperatrix Virgo Gloriosa point to a crucial methodological problem how to classify music which has a sacred monophonic cancio as a model, but at the same time is not a simple setting of the song. The term uh, song motet used by older literature in connection with compositions for three voices by Johannes Turut may help at the beginning. At the same time, a rethinking of the traditional division of 15th century music into mass, motet and song as taken over from Johannes Tinktoris, is needed in order to face specific features of musical culture in Central Europe. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>